I'm Pastor Dewey Wise uh, on staff at Pineville Church of the Nazarene. I'm going to share with you today from uh, our scripture lessons for this quarter. Uh, before I get started, just let me share with you. The, uh, we hope you have a very Merry Christmas and a blessed 2021. The first units of this quarter deals with uh, some of the attributes of, Christ, of God. Back on December the 3rd, the lesson was about God is faithful. On the 13th, it talked about God is gracious. Tonight, we're going to deal with the fact that God is love. The scripture is found in 1 John chapter 4 and verses 7 through 21. Talking about the attributes of God, just a quick definition that I found recently. It says that uh, the attributes uh, describe who God is and what he does. We know that through the scripture, God has many attributes, but we're dealing with basically five during this part of the quarterly. I'm not going to read the scripture. I'll trust that you have read it or will read it sometimes in the future. But I want to talk about the love of God and how he loved and cared for us. The Apostle John is often described in scripture as the apostle of love. He's called that or known as the apostle of love because of the emphasis that he placed in his writings uh, on the theme of the love, of love. Our scripture unwraps the implications of love in God's essential nature his attribute and characteristics. It's God's nature. God's nature is love. Then we, God's children, should reflect this love in the way that we face life and we face relationships. Our scripture tells us that God's love is some, something that changes our lives through the indwelling presence of the Spirit. As a result, it offers how we interact with each other and how we face the future, transformed by the presence of God's love in our life. <clears throat> Verses 7 through 12, uh, the theme there is uh, uh, built around God's love for us and how our response should be to love God and to love others. Jesus that came on that first Christmas morn is the evidence of the depth and the breadth of God's love for each of us. By giving his son, God reached through time to touch human life. John wrote in chapter 4 and verse 10, This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It was because of the love that God had for us that he was willing to send his son. And John chapter 3 and verse 16 tells us that it was his only son that he sent in order that the world might come to know him. The thing is, we do not have to search for God he sent his son to redeem us. I read a story recently in a book that I retrieved out of a box that I was sending to uh, somewhere to be sold. Uh, some of you probably read some of the uh, books that deal with, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Some of the books that deal with uh, uh, some of the topics that we share and talk about. This one came out of Chicken Soup for the Soul for Christians. And it was a story of a young man named Tommy. Tommy uh, attended the university and as a freshman, he walked into a class, a uh, theology of faith class that was being taught. The professor looked at him as he walked in and says, oh, well, this he's unusual, his hair was long, and he, he, he just didn't fit into the crowd that day. 
and the professor thought, okay, uh, we'll see how it turns out. Tommy turned out to be the atheist in residence at the school that year and in that theology class. He uh, constantly objected to uh, the stories and to the lessons that dealt with uh, God's love and how God cared and his unconditional love. Uh, he would laugh and snicker through all of it. At the end of the course, Tommy turned in his final exam and as he was preparing to leave, he asked in a kind of a cynical tone, do you think, do you think I'll find God? The prof deciding on making a kind of a shocking answer said to Tommy, no. And Tommy responded, I thought that was the product that you were pushing here. He turned to walk out the door, and as he left that day, at the door, the professor called him and said, Tommy, I don't think you'll ever find him, but I'm certain that he will find you. Tommy graduated, left, but then came the report that Tommy had terminal cancer and the professor trying to contact him one day, Tommy showed up at class and began to talk to him. He said, I've been searching, but nothing's happened. I've been trying to find God, but nothing's taken place. And then he said, I remembered a comment that you made in one of the classes when you said the essential sadness is to go through life without loving, but it would be equally sad to leave this world without telling those you love that you have loved them. And Tommy said, so I began that day with the hardest. I went to my father and told him that I loved him. My father did two things that day he had never done before. When he dropped his newspaper, he stood up, hugged me, and said, I love you. Telling mother and my sister it was easier. And then I worked through telling my friends and others that I loved them. After doing that, one day I turned around and God was there. He was present. He found me even after I stopped looking for him. Buster said, you, you mean you're saying the surest way to finding, uh, finding God is through uh, not just being a, a, a private possession, but by opening up to love and to tell others of the love you have for them. Remember, God is love and God wants us to love others. The scripture also talks about the Trinity in verses 13 through 16. This amazing passage from John 4 affirms the Trinity. In verse 14, the Holy Spirit reveals that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at work even in our society and in our world today in 2020 with all of its uh, ups and downs he is at work today we need to remember that god's love teaches our world through the hand, touches our world through the hand and the feet of christians in those verses john provides the foundation of which we can know that we are christians he talked about the fact that uh, in verse 13, that we have received his spirit. And then in verses 14 and 15, he talks about, uh, we now uh, testify that Jesus has come as the savior of the world. And he sums it up that we have come to experience the love of God personally. I'm not quite sure that we will ever understand God's love 
the side of eternity. But John clarifies how the believer's confidence is connected to Jesus and love. We understand that love is made complete among believers by the lives that they live, and they live like Christ in the world today. As the Spirit leads us into a life of love, he brings us toward the goal that God has for us, and that is being more like him. John chapter 8, uh, verse 18 in that fourth chapter tells us there is no fear in love. The power and presence of God's perfect love drives out fear. Believers receive love from God, but this love also transforms our lives, making it possible to love both God and others more effectively. The one who fears lives with constant, the one who fears lives with constant anxiety at the prospect of standing before God's judgment. God's love takes our fear away. John sums up the basis for this uh, warning to believers to love one another when he started in verse 8. We love because he first loved us. Our res response of love to God and others is only possible because of God's pre-existing love. The profession of love is easy. We can all say that we love. But the true trust and the true test of love is found in our actions. A true believer cannot love God and hate a brother or sister at the same time. John follows up his love text with a command. In verse 21, it says, Whoever loves God must also love his brother. I trust that You'll find it easy in these days ahead to share the love that you have with those that you come in contact with. Remember, any of us can talk about love, but we have to be willing to let God use us and to love one another. Thank you.